I am happy to again introduce Ken. This is week five of the series of Jacob, which has been an incredible series. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was wondering if that was because he said it's the last in the series. <laughs> slides going. There we go. Uh, it's, it's been fun to be with you for the past few weeks. Um, putting this together and looking at the life of Jacob is, uh, is a real challenge. Uh, Jacob's a unique character to me. Uh, you know, the unlikely patriarch. I mean, you look at him and Boy, he just doesn't deserve it. And then I say, neither do I. And so we're going to kind of wrap things up for Jacob today. Um, we've been working on his life here. We got to the point where God said, go back. Go back. And he's getting back. And this week we're going to look at the blessings and the contrast to the way Jacob started out. Jacob was a taker. And this week we see him as a giver. He's giving blessings. And so that's kind of the way we're going to wrap it up today. And I just kind of listed the events that we're going to cover. We have a lot of material. I thought, you know, for a chapter and a half this shouldn't be too bad. Um, but we're going to have to fly low and look at some things in Jacob's life uh, as he kind of pulls it all together. And we start with that final encounter of Jacob's with God. Let me back up a second. He's had five times that, he's, that God has contacted him and said, Jacob, this is what I want of you. And so today we're going to look at the very last one when God gives him some comfort. And we're, we read that God spoke to Israel in a vision. He said, Jacob. Jacob says, here I am. What struck me is, do I use that phrase with God? Here I am. What do you want from me? And Jacob was always willing to respond to God and say, here I am. What will you have me do? And so we see that. And God says, he's the God of your father. And here's another expression I was enamored with. Do not be afraid. I've often thought that would make a great study. The do not be afraid. How many times especially when God encounters somebody, he says, do not be afraid. Um, Jacob, like any of us, when God approaches us, should have an initial reaction of almost fear and respect and awe. And then God calms us and he says, don't be afraid. He says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt because I'm going to make you into a great nation down there and I'm going to go with you and I'm going to bring you back again and Joseph's own hand is going to close your eyes. Now if you remember last week at the end, Joseph's brothers had come back, they'd gone down to Egypt for food all of a sudden now they find out, oh, this guy's Jacob or this guy's Joseph I'll, I'll get the names right. They all begin with J's. But we'll, we'll get there. Um, make the appropriate translation if you have to, if I use the wrong name. Um, and so Jacob says, okay, I'm going down to Egypt, and we'll see what we can find there. So God has told him what he wants to do, and he's given him a promise. He says, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to make you into a great nation. 
He's already got 12 sons, but he says, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and I'm going to bring you back again. And so Jacob and his family go down to Egypt. And what do we read? All those who went with Jacob and his direct descendants and his, their wives and was 66 persons, but it was 70 in all if you count Joseph and his family. Now the reason that's so significant, I think, he had just told them, I'm going to make you a great nation. And he's going down, down there with basically 70 people that are going to be there. And I came across this verse in Exodus. It says, the Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. So how many does that make? A bunch. Well over a million, I would guess. And so we begin to see the promise that God gave him beginning to take place. And he goes down there with just a few people. And in Egypt, they're going to grow over the next 400 years. Things aren't going to go great for them always down in Egypt. They became slaves. And you'd have to look at it and say, what does God mean? I'm going to make you into a great nation. We're slaves down here. But God had other plans for him. I don't know about you, but I want things solved immediately. Okay. There's a problem. Why is this going on? God, I prayed last night. Why hasn't it changed today? And God says, my, my timetable is different than yours. And so we've got 600,000 plus people coming back that were descendants of Jacob. This is the great nation that comes back. So Jacob gets there, and Joseph decides to introduce him to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come. I find this really fascinating. He says, settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Pharaoh had to be very impressed with Joseph. And that's another fun study to do is the life of Joseph. And we've only touched on the borders of it a little bit here. But he says, I want you to have the best part of the land. And so Joseph brought his father and Jacob and presented him before Pharaoh. And then Jacob blessed Pharaoh. We aren't told what he said. Jacob did a lot of blessing in these chapters. He blessed his sons, he blessed Joseph's sons, he even blessed Pharaoh. I find that kind of interesting. Pharaoh was a pagan king. In and of himself, probably wanted nothing to do with God. I don't know what impact, we aren't told what kind of impact Joseph and Jacob had on him, but Jacob blessed him. And then... Jacob asked to be buried back in Canaan. He said, what, he lived in Egypt for 17 years. When the time drew near, he called for Joseph and he said to him, if I found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you'll show me kindness and faithfulness. <laughs> now I'm kind of glad that that's not how we make promises today. You put your hand yeah. under somebody's thigh. I'm sure the lawyers would have a great time with that one. But, and he says, don't bury me in Egypt. I don't want to stay here. I want to go back and carry me out and bury me where my ancestors are buried. Jacob was going to inherit the promise that had been given to Abraham and said, this land is going to be yours. And Jacob said, I know we're displaced for a while, but I want to go back. Don't let them bury me here in Egypt. And then a very unique thing happens. Jacob blesses Joseph's sons. And he says, when your two sons were born in Egypt, before I came here, 
they will be reckoned as mine. Jacob says, your sons will have equal inheritance to my sons. Now, remember Joseph was a favorite of Jacob. And Jacob is saying, this is the same just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. My two oldest sons, these are going to be the equivalent of them. Is that me? No. I if I clicked at a radio station or something. <laughs> Somebody isn't paying attention to Dick's announcements uh, at the beginning. But he says, any other sons that you have here, they're on their own, they're your kids. But these two will be equal to any of my sons. And so Jacob blessed Joseph. And he said this. I think this is an interesting blessing. He says, may the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. And I kept thinking, that's a stretch, Jacob. That's a stretch. But whether he was an obedient sheep, God was always his shepherd. And he was always reaching out for him. And he said, may they be called by my name, the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. So Jacob has blessed these two sons. And then Jacob blesses his other sons. The priority to me was interesting here. He went and he blessed Joseph's sons. And then he went and blessed his own. And he we can't go through all 12 of these. I would encourage you, if you get a chance, find, I went out and Googled, Jacob blesses his kids. Well, I use sons, but you get the idea. Yeah. And there's some interesting write-ups about how these blessings came to pass with each of these sons. But we're only gonna look at a couple of them. And here's what he said, Reuben, you're my firstborn. Turbulent, you're no longer going to excel. Nice blessing. Okay. You went up on your father's bed and defiled it. Remember, he went and had sex with one of the handmaids. And he says, you've lost your rights as firstborn because of what you've done. So that was his blessing. Then Simon and Simeon and Levi, these two went up and remember they had, their sister had been raped by some of the men in Succoth or Shechem and they went and they killed a whole bunch of people in that town. And he says, that's not the way you deal with this kind of stuff. So their swords are weapons of violence. I will disperse them in Israel. And we're going to look at it in a couple minutes of how they were dispersed. But if you think of the 12 tribes of Israel, you don't hear of, there's no land for Levi. And actually, Simeon got scattered in the country of the nation of Judah. And so this one also comes true over time. And then he goes to Judah. Your brothers will praise you. The scepter will not depart from Judah until he to whom it belongs shall come. This is one of the early prophecies of the coming of, of Jesus Christ himself. And all of a sudden, Judah has become a very prominent <coughs> offspring, the prominent offspring of Jacob himself. He blesses his sons from Leah first. Then he goes through each of the handmaids. And then finally he has, says this about Joseph. He says, you're a fruitful vine. 
And looking back on his life, he says, look, you were attacked by your brothers. Think of what they did, but your bow remained steady. You didn't let them get to you because of your father's God who helps you. He says, that's the reason you were so steady and firm and hung on is because my God has protected you. And he says, let all of the rest of the heads of Joseph on the brow of the, on the, brow of the prince among his brothers. Let him be a prince among his brothers. And we're going to see that Joseph ended up with a double portion. And I, I went and I, I found a map that shows the 12 tribes of Israel. And I don't remember, I encouraged you a couple weeks ago, use that atlas in the back of your Bible every once in a while. But it's kind of interesting. First of all, you see that Simeon doesn't have a, won't have a country of his own. And these countries were defined when Moses came out and brought all the Israelites out of Egypt. And they set up the territories, and they cast lots, and this is how they fell. And Simeon is here, and I've kind of highlighted, here are Leah's sons, which are Simeon, Judah, Reuben, Issachar. I can't see that far. I can't imagine how bad it is for those of you in the back. Zebulun, okay. And those are the sons of Leah, and that's the territories they got. The green shows Dan and Naphtali. He had a, they were nations. And then Zilpah's sons, which were Gad and Asher. And then there's Rachel's sons, and you think, okay, that's, Joseph and Benjamin. But again, Joseph's name doesn't appear here. Because his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, were to become heads of their tribes and their nations. So I think it's just kind of interesting to see. And if you remember, Manasseh's on here twice because they didn't want to, they thought the land was great on the other side of the Jordan and they wanted to stay there. So half of them went where they were supposed to and half of them stayed. Um, but it's, it, it's fascinating to see how God is working through all of this. And he says, I'm going to scatter you. So he has scattered Simeon and notice Levi doesn't appear either. Because Levi which became the priestly family, and they had cities all throughout all of the other countries or the, the, the tribes of Israel. And so they too were scattered in a very different way. But they're there and available. And then finally, Jacob dies. that he gave all of his sons these instructions. He said, I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me in the cave where Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried, and there Isaac and Rebekah were buried, and there I buried Leah. And he says, I want you to take me back to the land. Promise me that. And then it says, when he finished giving the instructions, he grew up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered. So we know that Jacob wanted to go back. He said, please don't bury me in Egypt. This isn't my country. This isn't my nation. Take me back to the land that God promised to my fathers. And so Joseph went up with his father. I thought this was fascinating. All of Pharaoh's officials accompanied him. Now, I don't think they went back to make sure he came back to Egypt. I think Joseph was so revered in Egypt 
they went and they wanted to honor him as he buried his father. And so Jacob's sons did as he commanded them. They carried him into the land of Cana and they buried him with his fathers. And then they returned and they all came back to Egypt. And that kind of wraps up the story of Jacob. But I have a couple other things I want you to think about before we wrap this up today. I thought, what's, what's a good wrap-up verse for Jacob? And I, you got to stumble across some of these because Hosea isn't a book that most of us read on a regular basis. You know, we get into John, we get into Romans, we get into Matthew, Psalms, some of those kind of things. But Hosea? And this was said, this was said at a time at, when the northern kingdom was about to be taken into Assyria. And the warning was also then to the southern kingdom to say, let me give you some advice here. He says, in the womb, Jacob, Jacob grasped his brother's heel. As a man, he struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel, and he talked to him there. The Lord God Almighty, the Lord is his name. And then he gives this warning to both the northern and southern kingdom. And he says, but you must return to your God. You must maintain love and justice and wait for God always. That's the message that Jacob kept getting when he was alive. Quit fighting it. Return to God. Listen to him. Obey him. And he will be your God also. Now, you've got some discussion questions for today to think about. You know, how is this Jacob different from the one we saw week one, two, three, and four? We see some changes in Jacob. And I also want you to think about what lesson do you take away from this? I think I told you a couple weeks ago when I go through scriptures and look at them, I ask three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? What am I going to do about it? Okay. What, what lesson hit you as you went through the life of Jacob? And then I also have a final thought for you. And I need to give you a little bit of background on this. Um, years ago, I was very much into music. Uh, my folks, I could, I could read music before I could read, because my folks gave me accordion lessons. And I played the accordion for many years, and then my monkey died, and it just wasn't the same <laughs> after, after that. But I, I taught myself a little bit how to play piano. I could, I could do the right hand because I could read that. I couldn't read the left hand because accordion is just very, very different. And so I sort of had the fake of the left. I was never very good, but I enjoyed it. Um, and then I got into writing music. And writing is very interesting activity. And so, I, I wrote some music. I'm going to share one of those songs. I'm not going to sing it because I can't do that. Um, but I want to encourage you to take time. This song for me has become Psalm 151. Now, you'll never find it in any of the translations because it's not divinely inspired or anything like that. But I would encourage you to sit down and write your own psalm. And people say, I can't write. And I came across this quote that I kept on my desk and on my piano. And when I was uh, writing, I had assignments in the, some of the classes I took at Bethel. We had to write a paper every week. And I said, oh my goodness, this is awful. And I came across this quote, and I don't know if you can read that from the back, but here it is framed on my desk. It says, writing is easy. Just sit down at a keyboard and open up a vein. I love that thought. 
So how do you write and express what you feel and worship to God? You know, we, as we sang those hymns this morning, I thought these people have just opened up a vein and talked about how they feel about God. And he doesn't worry if the words rhyme or if the meter is correct or anything like that. But take some time, maybe this coming week, and say, I want to write my own song. I want to write my own praise piece for God himself and show how I feel. And so I did this. And I, as I thought about Abraham, Jacob calls it the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I thought, how many things do we hear that God is the God of? And we see that phrase all throughout scriptures. And so this is what I wrote. God of love, God of light, God of joy and of compassion, God of grace and forgiveness, and God of mercy too. God of peace, God of hope, God of miracles and wonder, God of joy, God of blessings, and our salvation too. God of earth, God of heaven, God of land and sky and seas, you are God of all creation, God of all that lives and breathes. God of Abraham and Isaac, and oh yes, <laughs> you're the God of Abraham. Jacob too. But of all that you were God of, I am still most thankful that you will always be God of me. Now I realize that's grammatically terrible. <laughs> but my God didn't fit there. But he is the God of me. And he is the God of you. And we need to be thankful and worship him for that. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that each one of us can say that you are my God, that you are the God of me. Thank you for the lessons that we learn from the life of Jacob. How although he had some awful characteristics, awful traits, awful behaviors, you still reached out to him. And, you, and, and he responded to your call. Thank you for having us respond to you and come to you for our salvation. You are a wonderful God. You're an amazing God. You're beyond our comprehension. Why you'd want to save us, we can't figure that out, but you did. And we thank you and praise you and worship you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.